Hello and welcome to the Political History of the United States, episode 1.17, The Beginnings of Diplomacy. By the end of the first winter in Plymouth, the Pilgrims had seen roughly half of their company die. However, with winter giving way to spring, thankfully for the Pilgrims in early spring, we begin to see their fortunes change. This week, we are going to look at the end of the winter and the emergence of early diplomacy between the Plymouth and the local Indian tribes. Specifically, I want to spend some time laying out who these groups were, the formation of diplomatic relationships between them and the colonists, and finally compare this to the situation that we had seen previously in Jamestown. These differences are going to be a major reason why the New England colony thrives and Jamestown struggles. As brutal as that first winter in New England must have seemed to the colonists, it actually turns out to have been a relatively mild winter. Now, I get that you're probably grumbling that I've set it up for some epic winter for the past few weeks, but let me explain. For the Pilgrims, this was a brutal winter. The conditions in Plymouth were far harsher than what they had ever expected in either England or during their time in Holland. The Pilgrims in Plymouth were surviving a New England winter short on supplies and with inadequate shelter. While there are absolutely going to be worse winters in the future... The Pilgrims don't know that yet, and right now they only know what the first one was like. And during that first two months, half of their numbers died. By the beginning of March 1621, the winter had begun to subside. This abnormally early into the winter provided a much-needed bit of relief for the colonists and likely helped keep their death totals from reaching those seen during the first year in Jamestown. As the winter gave way to the spring, the main question about the future of the colony turned to the Indian question. During a meeting... Ironically, on military matters, in the middle of February, two Indians were spotted on nearby Watson's Hill. What ensued appears to have been an odd standoff between the two groups. The Pilgrims, led by Miles Standish, got their muskets. And then both sides basically hung out, signaling the other to come over. Standish finally decided to give in and head across the river himself for a meeting. However, at this point, the Indians decided that they wanted nothing to do with it, and they were the ones who took off. Clearly, this must have been concerning for the Pilgrims, and the decision was made that they should probably speed up the process of getting the guns quickly mounted upon the hill. The following month, during another military meeting, this situation is going to go ahead and repeat itself. Appearing first on Watson's Hill, a lone Indian was spotted. However, there would be no staring this time as the Indians were moving towards the colony. His arrival is detailed in the publication Mort's Relation. And while I've not quoted from Mort's relation directly yet, I have been using it periodically during these episodes. Just a little background on the book. This is another one of our major primary sources that we have from those early days in Plymouth. The author appears to have been a collaboration between Edward Winslow, who was the primary author, and who else other than William Bradford. Mort's relation describes this meeting in the following manner. And whilst we busied ourselves hereabout, we were interrupted again, for there presented himself a savage, which caused alarm. He very boldly came all alone, and along the houses straight to the rendezvous, where we intercepted him, not suffering him to go in, as undoubtedly he would, out of his boldness. He saluted us in English and bade us welcome, for he had learned some broken English among the Englishmen that came to fish at Monchagon, and knew by name most of the captains, commanders, and masters that usually came. He was a man free in speech so far as he could express his mind, and of a seeming carriage. We questioned him of many things. He was the first savage we could meet with all. This particular Indian went by the name of Samoset. Samoset was a shaman, or chief, of another New England tribe located up in modern-day Maine. Samoset contributed his English skills to interactions he had with the English fishermen who would frequent his territory. Most interestingly, He informed the pilgrims that another man named Squanto lived nearby and he was very well versed in English himself. Samoset was acting as a foreign diplomat here. The first of the local tribes in the Plymouth area to attempt contact were the Wampanoag people, who were being led by Massasoit. Massasoit understood the dangers and the advantage of the Englishmen, and he was interested in formulating some kind of an agreement. Samoset was the man sent to open negotiations. Initially, the question for Massasoit was much the same as the question poised in the early years for Powhatan. What to do about the English dilemma? Massasoit had few options. He could attack the English and eliminate them that way. Much as Powhatan had, he had superior numbers, and despite the better weapons possessed by the English, he probably would have been successful in that endeavor. 
He could completely ignore the English and leave them to their own devices. This may well have been the most dangerous of the options. Unless the English managed to die out on their own, they were going to spread and leave Massasoit without any kind of an ally. The final option is that he could seek an alliance with the English. This, as we saw in Jamestown, came with its own set of very real dangers. Helping Massasoit make this very important decision was Squanto. Squanto was a member of the Patuxet tribe, which lived in and around the Plymouth area. Little is known about his early life, however, it appears that he was captured and taken forcefully back to Spain in 1614 by the English explorer Thomas Hunt. Squanto was initially sold into bondage, however, was able to escape his captivity and return to North America in 1619. While this was unfortunate for Squanto, it was a fortunate break for the English. Squanto was quick to advocate against war with the Pilgrims. Now, to be clear, Squanto was not some high-minded pacifist. Rather, he recognized that the English had weapons, weapons that would make any potential attack very, very costly. It is important to understand that while Massasoit did outnumber the 50 or so English, he was not sitting on top of something like the Powhatan Confederacy. Costly losses could mean that his Indian rivals would gain an advantage against him, something that he was likely less than interested in causing. Squanto also seemed to advocate that the English also held a proverbial trump card, disease. Squanto counseled that the English not only carried disease with them, but that they were able to control it and deploy it as a weapon at will. And I can't find a source that delves into how serious he was in that belief, but in some ways it does make sense. Squanto, nor the English, had any clue about concepts like how disease spreads or immunity. From his perspective, it probably did look like the English could release diseases upon demand. After all, when diseases start spreading, it was always the Indians who suffered the most. Knowing this, it really isn't difficult to see why he would have believed that it was deployable as a weapon. Finally, consider that amongst the tribes in the Cape Cod region, Europeans were not anything new for them. These were not an alien people, and in fact, Europeans had been coming to the region for a while at this point. While not establishing settlements, they were coming for the purpose of exploiting the extremely productive fishing industry off the Cape. With these things in mind, Massasoit decided that the English were probably going to be better allies than they were enemies. Despite understanding that Squanto understood the language and English in general, Massasoit really didn't like or trust the guy. So instead of taking the risk and sending Squanto initially just to let him stab him in the back, he instead chose to have Samoset make that first visit. And this makes sense. Squanto had a much better command of the language. If he wanted to stab Massasoit in the back and form his own agreement with the English, he at least had a chance. Samoset had limited command of the English language and really just enough for some basic communication. This makes him much less risky, especially on a first contact. However, after that first contact, when it became clear that real diplomacy was going to be required, Squanto was the only serious option for Massasoit. He knew the language, he knew the customs, and he knew that he was going to have to be Massasoit's guy. About a week after that first contact from Samoset, a larger delegation of Indians made their way into the colony. Among the members of this five-person group were Squanto and Samoset. Initial conversations between Squanto and the Pilgrims were mostly filled with pleasantries, and then a period where both sides waxed poetically about the locations in England that both parties had been to. With a common bond established, it was time to get down to business. After their initial conversations, Squanto informed the Pilgrims that Massasoit wanted to come visit them and that he would appear shortly. Sure enough, as though this was planned, Massasoit appeared on nearby Watson's Hill. Massasoit also didn't come alone. He was accompanied by a large number of warriors, and this was likely to accomplish two ends. The first is obvious. He wants to remind the pilgrims not to get any funny ideas and actually try to do something stupid. Beyond that, though, there was a much deeper meaning. This is clearly a show of force, a not-so-subtle reminder that the pilgrims really didn't have the option if they wanted to make a peace. It was a requirement. Guns, cannon, and disease aside, Massasoit wanted to make his advantage clear. He had enough men that even with the superior weapons, the English were always going to be at a very clear disadvantage. It was decided that Edward Winslow would be the messenger for the pilgrims, and he would be the first to meet Massasoit personally. The nice thing about this is that Winslow was the co-author of Mort's Relation, and while he didn't write this portion of the journal, we know that he was working with Bradford, who did write it down. So what do we know about this meeting? In this situation, I can't really do much than just share the words of the people who were there. So we are going to look at the description of the meeting found in Mort's relation. 
Our messenger made a speech unto him, that King James saluted him with words of love and peace, and did accept him as a friend and ally, and that our governor decided to see him and to truck with him, and to confirm a peace with him as his next neighbor. He liked well of the speech and held it attentively, though the interpreters did not express it well. After he had eaten and drunk himself, and given the rest of his company, he looked upon our messenger's sword and armor which he had on, with intimation of his desire to buy it. But on the other side, our messenger showed his unwillingness to part with it. In the end, he left him in the custody of Quanaquina, his brother, and came over the brook, and some twenty men following him, leaving all their bows and arrows behind them. We kept six or seven as hostages for our messenger, Captain Standish, and Master Williamson met the king at the brook with half a dozen musketeers. They saluted him and he them, so one going over, the one on the other side, and the other side on the other conducted him to the house and then into the building, where we placed a green rug and three or four cushions. Then instantly came our governor with drum and trumpet after him, and a few more musketeers. After salutations, our governor kissing his hand, the king kissed him, and they sat down. The governor called for some strong water and drunk to him, and he drank a great drought that made him sweat all the while after. He called for a little fresh meat, which the king did eat willingly and did give his followers. Okay, so there's a lot to unpack here, so let's just go ahead and move through this and see what we can get out of it. The first thing that really comes into focus here is the diplomatic posturing. The English take their time making opening statements and try to put on what appears to be a bit of pageantry for the Indians. Winslow opens with a speech about love and peace and expresses his hope not to make war but rather make a lasting peace. Interestingly, Winslow is clearly annoyed that the speech was not properly conveyed, although the exact nature of the misrepresentation is lost to history. There was a hostage exchange, again just to be sure that nobody was planning something stupid like a surprise ambush. Massasoit seems to have taken a liking to Winslow's sword and armor, and he even offered to buy it. However, Winslow, probably intelligently, decided that he didn't really want to make a weapons deal right now, so he went ahead and politely declined the deal. After the pleasantries were finished, it was decided that Winslow himself would hang back as a hostage, and that Massasoit would be escorted into Plymouth to meet with Governor Carver. By all accounts, the pilgrims treated Massasoit with all the due respect of a foreign dignitary. Behind ensuring that all the form and decorum was properly done was most likely William Brewster. Recall that Brewster was not exactly new to the world of politics and the intricacies of hosting foreign leaders. Back in episode 1.14, I mentioned that Brewster had worked for William Davison, who had been the Secretary of State under Elizabeth. That didn't end well, of course. However, it isn't like Brewster had forgotten how to play the game. Together, Massasoit and Carver came to an agreement concerning the conduct by the two groups. The agreement was recorded in Mort's relation by Bradford. The agreement is as follows. 1. That neither he nor any of his should injure or do hurt to any of our people. 2. And if any of his did hurt any of ours, he should send the offender and that we might punish him. 3. That if any of our tools are taken away when our people are at work, he should cause them to be restored, and if ours did any harm to any of his, we would likewise to them. 4. If any did unjustly war against him, we would aid him. If any did war against us, he should aid us. 5. He should send to his neighbors confederates to certify them of this, that they may not wrong us, but might likewise be comprised in the conditions of peace. 6 that when their men came to us, they should leave their bows and arrows behind them, as we should do with our pieces when we came to them. Let's take a moment and go through these provisions one at a time. The top provision is one of mutual peace, a very simple agreement that we won't attack you and you don't attack us. Beyond that, however, is the agreement that, should such an incident take place, both sides agree to provide the offender to the other for justice to be administered. The third provision covers situations of theft. The fourth item is a mutual agreement of defense. And again, this is a really big deal between the two sides. The agreement here goes beyond a simple peace agreement and moves into the territory of an actual alliance. And sure, there might be some squabbling over what unjust means, but still, this is a big deal. The fifth item is an agreement of mutual cooperation. Finally, the sixth item covers what happens when meeting with each other, both sides agree to come without weapons. 
The agreement reached between the Pilgrims and Massasoit was relatively simple. However, it's a big deal. This is a piece that is going to endure for decades and will be a key factor towards helping the Pilgrims survive those early years, and is going to help the eventual explosion in population that we are going to see during the 1630s. Years in the future, when a war breaks out between the Pilgrims and the Quat people, this agreement, crucially, is going to keep Massasoit out of the war. There are a couple key things to keep in mind with the situation. First, Massasoit isn't Powhatan. He isn't at the head of some huge confederacy. While this certainly was a big step in the right direction, Massasoit didn't have the command or the power that Powhatan had. Of course, he had friends and allies of his own, but Massasoit's agreement with the Pilgrims didn't have the binding ability over those other tribes. While he might be able to put in a good word and even put some pressure on those tribes, his influence didn't extend much beyond that. Crucially, however, with this piece was the agreement that Massasoit established a system of assistance that would help ensure the survival of the English. Massasoit's men returned a few weeks after signing the treaty and helped plant corn, something that was going to be a crucial crop for the pilgrims' survival. Squanto would remain living amongst the pilgrims and would help teach them how to fish in the local waters. Squanto notably taught the English that using ground up herring as a fertilizer was an important part of growing successful corn crops in the poor coastal soils in Plymouth. The success of growing corn meant that the pilgrims would have a reliable food supply moving into the winter. This is where I want to pause for a moment to compare the pilgrims to the settlers down south of Virginia. Arriving in November, it took the pilgrims until the later part of March to come to a diplomatic agreement with Massasoit. In Virginia, by contrast, the relationship with Powhatan was always operating with a low level, and at times a very high level, amount of hostility and tension. There is also the fact that we see the pilgrims immediately accept help and allow Squanto to help them plant corn. In Virginia, what we saw was demands by the settlers to the Indians that they deliver the corn. And while Powhatan did agree and provide corn for at least a while, the Jamestown settlers became reliant on it and failed to become self-sufficient in any meaningful way. This is why when Powhatan decides that he is done playing along, you end up with almost the entire colony dying. The pilgrims, on the other hand, accept the help. They learn from Squanto the tricks on how to fertilize the soil. They choose to learn the Indian way and not simply import their European customs. They understood that a different geographical location meant a different technique was going to be needed. A big part of this can really be contributed to the background differences between the pilgrims and the Jamestown settlers. Those settling in Jamestown were going for one of two reasons. Either they were heading out trying to make their fortune in the New World, or they were the lower rungs of London society who the rich in London didn't want hanging around, so they were shipped across the Atlantic to work. The Jamestown settlers had no practical experience and were all but lost. Additionally, the Jamestown settlers proved to be more interested in finding gold than they were ever in planting crops. But Plymouth was largely a different creature altogether. A large number of the settlers were coming from the Leiden congregation. Those members knew the difficulties that came with being immigrants. After all, they were forced to flee England to Leiden and had lived for years there. They knew the struggles and they knew their own abilities, and what they knew was how to survive. Those from Leiden, at least, didn't come looking for riches. They came looking for a place where they could find religious freedom. They weren't there to seek out gold or silver deposits. They wanted the freedom to worship without the risk of reprisal from the government. And sure, some of the strangers may have been interested in striking it rich. However, with the Leideners making such a key part of the group, those desires were at least temporarily sidelined, understanding that survival was always going to take priority over a personal profit. Coming to a diplomatic solution with the Indians and agreeing to adapt techniques for farming in North America meant that the Pilgrims were going to be able to have a steady food supply. Even if the alliance between Massasoit and the Pilgrims fell apart, it isn't like the Pilgrims were going to forget the farming practices that they were taught by Squanto. They had the ability to become self-sustaining far quicker than what we see down in Jamestown. This agreement to not only work with the Indians, but understand what they needed to do to survive is going to go a long way in explaining why the Pilgrims miss out on so much of the continuing struggles that we see during the early period of the Jamestown settlement. With all of this talk about stability, it is still important to keep in mind that Plymouth is in fact a very harsh place to live. In April of 1621, while working on planting the new fields of corn, their governor John Carver was working in the field when he complained of not feeling well. William Bradford writes, In this month of April, whilst they were busy about their seed, their governor, Mr. John Carver, came out of the field very sick, it being a hot day. 
He complained greatly of his head and lay down, and within a few hours his senses failed. So he never spoke again until he died, which was within a few days thereafter, whose death was much lamented and caused great heaviness amongst them, as there was cause. He was buried in the best manner they could, with some volleys of shot by all that bore arms, and his wife, being a weak woman, died within five or six weeks after him. And that's it. John Carver, the first governor in Plymouth, was dead. Carver had been a part of the congregation since the days in Leiden. He is suspected of being the author of the Mayflower Compact. He was an instrumental figure in the recent peace agreement with Massasoit. And now he was dead. The pilgrims did what they could to send Carver off with ceremonial trappings that such a man deserved. And then just five weeks later, Carver's wife would also die. With the death of Carver, it was time to select a new leader. Carver's death would also mark the beginning of some instability within the colony as tensions began to rise. Specifically, it was once again our friend John Billington. Billington, as he did last time, would again begin to complain about the position of Miles Standish within the community. The Pilgrims needed a new governor, and they needed it quickly. For this task, the Pilgrims returned to William Bradford and his assistant, Isaac Allerton. Bradford had already established himself as one of the leading figures in Plymouth, and he was really just the logical choice. Bradford is going to hold this position off and on, though more on than off, until his death in 1657. Okay, so to finish up this week, I'm going to move through two quick items that are pretty much unrelated to the topics this week, but they're still pretty interesting, and hey, I've got a podcast, and I'm going to go ahead and talk about it now. First, I want to briefly let you guys know what happened to the Mayflower. Like I said, it really doesn't matter at all for our story, but I was curious and figured some of you might also be kind of curious. After that, I'm going to briefly touch on the subject of the first Thanksgiving. The Mayflower left Plymouth on April 5th. Christopher Jones had seen his crew hit hard from the same disease and illness that had rocked the Pilgrims. However, for all the trouble getting to North America months before, the trip back to England was pretty much uneventful. Jones quickly got back to work, and weeks after returning from North America, the Mayflower sailed to France with a shipment of salt. After returning from the trip to France, Jones returned to England where he quickly fell ill. In March of 1622, the captain of the Mayflower, Christopher Jones, died. The Mayflower, now without a captain, spent the next two years sitting in a harbor slowly rotting away. In 1624, the ship was in such bad condition that it was basically worthless. And that is the last thing we ever hear about the Mayflower. At this point, the ship, at best, was worth nothing more than some scrap. The record is unclear of what actually ever happened to the ship, but it seems like a good bet that the trip to France in 1621 was the final voyage for one of the most famous ships in American history. To finish up today, I want to also go ahead and address the first Thanksgiving. I would be remiss if I didn't at least mention this, as it is something that is so closely tied to the legend that has grown around the Pilgrims. I'm not going to spend a ton of time on this because, honestly, it really doesn't matter for our story at all. However, because Thanksgiving is such a huge part of the story of the Pilgrims, let's go ahead and spend the final minutes today on it. On Thursday, November the 22nd, 1621, the Pilgrims and the Indians celebrated their first Thanksgiving. Earlier in the day, there was a community football game, with the Indians defeating the Pilgrims 21-18 on a last-minute field goal by Samoset. Following the game, the entire group sat down to a large dinner. After some tense moments debating the benefits of white meat over dark meat, things went ahead and settled down. It was a great meal, there were four different kinds of pie, and both types of cranberry sauce. When John Billington told a mildly inappropriate story during dinner, everybody was so joyful that they nervously just laughed it off and said it was Uncle John being Uncle John. So there you go. That is the story of the first Thanksgiving. Okay, so obviously none of that is true. The event that is widely regarded today as the famous Thanksgiving took place sometime in the fall, probably between October and early November. All surviving members of the Mayflower, plus around 90 of Massasoit's people, got together for an end-of-harvest feast. The event lasted for three days and was basically a long, ongoing feast. Really, there wasn't a ton more to it. There was a successful harvest, the Indians had helped, and so a feast was held. Thanksgiving as we know it began to appear more and more during the Revolutionary Era. There had been, periodically, times of Thanksgiving before that, and that actually goes back to England. But an event resembling what those of us in the United States think of as Thanksgiving began with Washington in 1789. 
And even after 1789, Thanksgiving wasn't really a yearly celebration, but rather something that was occasionally called, sometimes more than once per year. These events were often called to celebrate major events in the young nation's history. And it wasn't until during the Civil War that then-President Lincoln made Thanksgiving into the federal holiday that we all know and love today. So there you have it, the very basic story of the first Thanksgiving. Next time, we are going to begin looking at the political developments during the first years in Plymouth. We have already covered the Mayflower Compact and today the beginning of diplomacy with the local Indian tribes. Next time, I want to begin looking at the government structures that were put in place in those first years and the long-term repercussions of those systems. So, until then, have a good two weeks and I will see you back here to continue our trip through Plymouth.